Today, we're talking with the host of the Books That Spark podcast, Terry Hillard Brown. Terry has just released a devotional called Building Character Through Picture Books, 25 Family Devotions Based on Favorite Picture Books. This devotion aims to make bedtime story time more meaningful with devotions based on popular books you might already be reading with your kids. Welcome to Bookworthy, Terry. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. It is my pleasure. Now, to start us off, Terry, since Easter is around the corner, what is your favorite Easter candy? Well, I honestly don't eat much candy because I react to it, but I do give in and have the Reese's peanut butter eggs sometimes. But the big controversy is I can't stand peeps and my children just think something's terribly wrong with me. <laughs> I agree with you. Peeps are disgusting. Yes, I, amen. I, I, yeah, I just want to like, mm, just, <laughs> just talking about them. <laughs> But once with those Cadbury, the mini Cadbury eggs came out, oh, I could yeah. like eat those like popcorn. And I'm like, this is dangerous. I dangerous for these. sure. Yes, I remember. Yeah. <laughs> Too fun. Now, Terry, do you have any special Easter traditions in your home? Well, the one that uh, makes my children cringe the most is that every Easter we choose a color for our clothing and our whole family dresses in that color and we take a picture. And, and most of the time it's fine. But one year I chose salmon and my sons thought it was pink and they were not happy <laughs> with the pink. And they still <laughs> tell me they dis were disappointed in that choice. But um, I'd kind of make them do that every year. And so. <laughs> We, we they they put up with me. <laughs> the traditional family Easter portrait is very important. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Even in salmon. <laughs> yes. I loved it. <laughs> <laughs> Too fun. Well, Terry, tell us a little bit about your podcast, Books That Spark. Well, I, we're on our fourth year, our fifth season, and we um, review picture books mostly. But I've started getting into a few more chapter books because I've had families like, help, you know, I don't have time to preview all the chapter books. And so I have a team helping me read chapter books. And so we're starting to review a few more of those. I've had a few more guests who write the chapter books for middle schoolers and high schoolers. And so that's been fun to get into. Um, but we also talk a lot about discipling our kids. So at the core of what we're talking about is everyday discipleship every day based on Deuteronomy, where it says, you know, as you go along your way, as you put the kids to bed, you know, to talk about the things, you know. And um, so that's really a focus of it, even though we mostly talk about picture books. Now, did your podcast kind of inspire your book of these 25 devotions? It did. Actually, I don't know if you know who Kathy Lip is, but she's a friend of mine and she's a writer and speaker. And she's like, you love writing devotionals and you love picture books. You should put them together in a picture book devotional. And I'm like, oh, my goodness, that's perfect. And I started working on it a couple years ago, but immediately started working on it and just loved it. It was the easiest and most fun I've had writing anything I've written. It just was my heart. So it was fun. So fun. It's great when that uh, your burden and your passion collide and it's a sweet spot in writing or in, I don't know, anything that we do for the Lord. True. It's, True. It's so yeah. fun. Now, um, how did you choose um, some of these books? You have several classic books like, what is it? Chica, uh, Chica Chica Boom Boom and Corduroy and The Runaway Bunny. and But then you have some newer books that are The Very Impatient Caterpillar and Llama Llama Red Pajama. What? Um, how did you choose the books that you highlighted in your devotional? Well, for this first one, I just chose some of my favorites <laughs> that I loved. They needed to be general market. And so I thought, of what are some of the most popular ones out right now that people already have in their library? And what are ones that they have in their library that are the classics? And um, so that's where I started. And I had a whole list and just pared it down to 25 
for the book and I'm, I'm working on the next 25 now. Um, but yeah, that's how I decided was just books I loved. I started with Grumpy Monkey. It's one of my favorites. <laughs> I just had to start there. Too cute. I was wondering, you know, did your favorite children's book end up on the first 25 list? Yeah, Grumpy Monkey, I Grumpy think Monkey. would be it. And then, of course, <laughs> I love We Don't Eat Our We Don't Eat Our Classmates. And that one's so funny. People who haven't aren't reading um, picture books, they're like, what? <laughs> <laughs> they don't know it's about a T-Rex. And so yeah. they got a little worried because I have a critique group who helped me, you know, go through it and stuff. And it was just so funny because like, they're, what is that book about? And I'm like, no, trust me, it's a T-Rex. It's good. It's funny. <laughs> <laughs> it is a very fun book. But yeah, if you didn't yeah. know it was a T-Rex, it would be kind of concerning. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> Too funny. What is your goal for this uh, devotional book? Well, my main goal, most of my followers are homeschoolers. So I wanted it to be something homeschoolers would love. But I believe whether you're homeschooling or not, we need to do family devotionals. And to come together as a family, if we're reading, if, you know, if we have kids who are five and others who are 12, we may not have a devotional that will match all of them. And so that was one of my main goals was to create a devotional where the family could come together. I think whether they want to admit it or not, every child enjoys picture books, even if they're 20. <laughs> and so the family could come together before bedtime, read the picture book together, and then have the devotional. And so within the devotional, I have questions for the older kids, as well as questions for the younger kids. And so those are there so the family can have just a, a short discussion before they pray and get ready for sleeping time. And, um, and then I also included some additional information for the parents. So if they wanted to continue the conversation at breakfast the next morning, or if they just wanted to do the devotional during the day and include a little more discussion, um, I have some activities, you know, just different things the parents can use as resources. But my main goal was that families could come together, whatever their children's age is, and have everyone be there for the same devotional really neat. I think what was it? C.S. Lewis said that, you know, a children's book that's only good for children isn't a good children's book. Yes. <laughs> so I love that you're, uh, you know, reaching, you know, an entire family and not just, you know, stuck on that, you know, younger age where that are reading picture books, but also leading teens and preteens to think about books that they loved when they were little and yeah. to think about them differently and deeper. Yeah, exactly. So fun. Now, when did your writing journey begin, Terry? Well, technically it began in Miss Carmen's second grade class <laughs> when she had us write a poem and we had to write about nature. And so I wrote about the moon and I loved it. I never realized I loved writing till then. <laughs> And I started just filling every piece of paper around me, every little book with poems. They were horrible, but I still, <laughs> I still wrote them. I even made my own little books. I always loved to draw as well. So I would have, I made a book of birds and, and it just on through growing up. And then when I got into high school, I was very, very shy and nobody believes me anymore, but <laughs> I was little. I was very shy. And so when I got to high school, I got into journalism and commercial art and I loved it. And my um, 12th grade, well, all of my English teachers were very strong in teaching writing, but my 12th grade teacher entered us in all kinds of contests. And so I won a lot of awards for my writing and that's, that encourages you a lot. <laughs> It does. <laughs> yeah. So that was like, okay, I can do this. And so I've never stopped writing since then. I, I haven't really pursued it as a career, so to speak, until recently, probably the past six, seven years. But I've always written uh, monologues for our church. I wrote the cantatas, you know, used other people's music, but wrote the the monologue or dialogue through the you know, program for Christmas and Easter, because we lived overseas, and it was hard to <laughs> ship things. And so I would just use songs we had to, available to us and then write a cantata um, for that and or a drama. So I've always used my writing in that way. But it's only been the past, uh, well, since we, we moved back to the States in 2016, 
that I have started really saying, I really want to do this as a career. So even though I'm old. <laughs> Never too old to start a good thing, right? Yeah. <laughs> now, um, tell us a little bit about where you were um, prior to 2016. You were a missionary over in Korea, is that correct? Taiwan. Taiwan. All right. Yes. <laughs> My bad. But Taiwan. So tell yeah. us a little bit about how that experience influenced um, your desire to write devotionals. Well, um, we moved to Taiwan in 1999 and we lived there for about 15 years um, and, and just not being able to get materials easily. You know, I didn't want to break any copyright laws, you know, so I was always trying to be very cognizant of that. And so, because in Taiwan, they don't really have copyright laws, so they don't care as much, but we did. And we wanted to be, you know, have some integrity about it all. So if I couldn't ship something to Taiwan, I would write what I needed. So that went into devotionals, that went into programs at church. It went into my teaching. I wrote curriculum when I needed to, you know, whatever I needed to do, I just wrote it. And, um, and I loved it. It was fun to do that. It took a lot of time, but I loved doing that. And then later on, while we were there, of course, being able to download things became much more popular. And so toward the end, I was able to use a lot more of things I could download, pay for and download. Um, but for years, we just didn't have that option. And so I, it was really a great way <laughs> to be forced into something that I turned out, it turned out that I loved. So that was very cool. neat. Yeah. Now raising kids over in Taiwan and trying to encourage them in faith, were family devotions really important in your home? Yes. Um, not as consistent as I would have liked. And I, I talk about that because I think it's important as homeschoolers, as moms, just moms, we are so hard on ourselves. And I wish when I was younger, if I could have talked to the younger me and just said, chill, <laughs> because I made life so hard for myself. Um, my kids had a great time. They tell me now they loved it. Everything was great to them. Um, but I felt like a failure so much of the time when I was homeschooling and I felt like I never was consistent with my devotionals with the kids. And so that's kind of where the everyday discipleship every day motto came from, because even though we didn't sit down at the table and do devotions at breakfast time, um, we talked about things all the time. When there was a teachable moment, I would try to grab it. And I think I was pretty good at that. <laughs> at you know, we may have, I may be thinking, oh, we're going over here. We're going to the library. We're going to do this. You know, we're always doing something. And I had four kids. Well, I had the fourth one while we were there. Um, had three when we moved there. But um, we would be in the middle of something and then something would happen. And I would be like, oh, teachable moment. And I would stop where I was going and turn and take that moment. And I really did try to do that well. That was something I really <laughs> prayed for God to help me see that and take the time to just shift for a second and talk to whatever was happening. Um, one of the ones that sticks in my mind is, I don't remember what was going on. It was probably Easter or something. And I had given the kids some candy. And they were doing this bartering. Well, if you'll give me one of yours, I'll give you one of mine. Because they all had a different favorite candy, right? So so they're bargaining with each other. And I thought, we're about two minutes away from a fight. Because that's just what happens. And I, I said, okay, guys, if you want to share your candy because you want to bless your brother or sister, that's fine. But don't do it expecting something in return. I said, when we give, we should give without expecting someone to retaliate or to that, that's not the right word, but to there, reciprocate, yeah. that's the word. Um, and, and then if they want to give to you, then you can feel blessed by that instead of, I expect you to do this. And it just changed the whole atmosphere of their attitude and what they were doing. And they started just blessing each other in that moment and sharing together. It didn't last forever, but for that moment, <laughs> they did a really good job. They got it. And I felt like it was a real teachable moment that just went well. It went really, really well. Um, so that one sticks in my mind a lot. <laughs> Very neat. I love how 
you know, it's even in my own parenting, I definitely get hard on myself. Oh, we know we need to do this, do this, do this, you know, because other people are doing this, that, and the other. But it's really those sweet teachable moments that we are just acting on in the midst of the crazy that yeah. really sit with our kids. I mean, devotion times and resources like you've uh, put together are amazing, but mm. there's no hard, fast rule that this has to be done in order for my children to grow in faith. And I love That's that. Right. <laughs> Thank God goodness. So gracious. Yes. <laughs> He's so gracious to use everyday moments when, you know, it's just too hectic and too crazy to sit down or, you know, I have two kids with ADHD. So having mm -hmm. them sit down for a formal devotional time is oh, yeah. just not in the cards. So we have to keep it very dynamic and very, I think the more we have a conversation and are just constantly talking about God and how God influences our world mm -hmm. and the way we think, the more our kids are going to catch like, oh, this is how we do things. This is how, yes. how we talk about things. So what God says on Sunday is the same thing happening on Wednesday and Thursday, you know, that kind of thing. So Yes, amen. Well, three <laughs> of my four are on the autism spectrum. And uh -huh. we didn't know that. They were misdiagnosed for a long time. Talk about guilt. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> I have stories. Brush it up, but... brush it up. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> trying to homeschool, not knowing, you know, with them having the wrong diagnosis, doing everything that just triggered their, um, it, what's the word? Their um, nervousness. I can't think of the word. Um, but, you know, I was tr told they had ADHD and you time ADHD kids and say, okay, we're just going to do this for this amount of time. But with an autistic or Asperger's kid, giving them a timer just sets off anxiety. That's the word sets off their anxiety. So I basically tortured my kids. <laughs> we got through, we all survived. We're all friends still, but um, you know, that was rough. And so daily. I felt like I'm doing something wrong. I'm a failure. I can't get this. I can teach a whole classroom of 40 kids. Why can't I teach my four? You know, <laughs> so because I'm a teacher, I should be able to do this. And so, yeah, it was, it was rough, but they, um, they grew up to still like us and they grew up to still love God. So we're good. <laughs> I love how what God can even use our mistakes and our mishaps to True. shape our kids to who they need to be in the life that God wants to lead them on. And so we're a part of the journey. We, even if we get it wrong, we're going to at least try to direct them towards God in some way. Yes. <laughs> like, Oh, mom needed Jesus today. Didn't she? Like, I need him just as much as you do. <laughs> yes. Well, and that's the thing I think with the devotionals as well, that we're honest. That's one of the things I talk about. If we're painting a rose garden and there's no thorns, we're not being truthful with our kids. If they don't see us struggling in our faith and, you know, sometimes questioning how long do we have to wait God for something we're really praying for, um, they need to see that they need, we need to be transparent with our kids. I mean, not, especially in ministry, we don't tell them everything um, or they'd never go back to church sometimes. <laughs> I mean, you know, like Henry Blackaby used to say the, his favorite part about ministry was the people and his worst part about the ministry was the people, <laughs> you know, so, you know, iron sharpens iron. And sometimes you just want to scream a little bit, but I didn't want my kids to hate church and I didn't want them to hate ministry. And so, so we protected them somewhat and we tried not to put expectations on them to be perfect little children. And you can talk to anybody in our church. They call them little monkeys sometimes. Um, <laughs> but we thought they need to be kids. They're just kids and they don't need to have that uh, put on them to be try to be perfect. And so they still love church and everything. So that's cool. I guess we did something right or God intervened anyway. <laughs> He is capable of doing that most definitely. Yes. <laughs> now, uh, you said that your kids were called little monkeys. Is that kind of why the grumpy monkey is one of your favorites? Oh, maybe. <laughs> that may be it. <laughs> Too fun. I love how those, you never know what inspires your likes and your dislikes. And sometimes just a little nickname can be like, oh, that's what makes this book even more special. <laughs> True. <laughs>
Well, uh, Terry, what's the most inspirational book that, or the most impactful book you have read in your life? It could be, it doesn't have to be a children's book. It could be any book other than the Bible. Okay. Um, <laughs> well, you took my Sunday school answer. No. I know. <laughs> um, well, I love C.S. Lewis because he makes me think. Um, but one of the most impactful books, I would say, is O. Halsby. Um, his book on prayer and it's just called prayer and it's, it's an old book, but you can still get it out there on the different websites, but it was life changing for me um, and showed me how important prayer is. And he actually says in the book that prayer is our occupation and it's just powerful. Um, So that one I think had one of the biggest impacts on my walk with God. And I mentioned Henry Blackaby experiencing God was revolutionary for me in my walk with God. So those two were really important. But one book I have to share for kids, um, and this is for older kids, it's a trilogy of chapter books. And it's The Journey of Souls by C.D. Baker. Mm -hmm. And I used this when I was teaching literature um, because it, it talks about the children's crusades. And those were so awful. Um, You know, children being taken into slavery when they thought they were going to uh, be involved in the Crusades and see peace come to Jerusalem. Um, And it's based on the historical research that Baker did, uh, C.D. Baker. I love his books. He's very meticulous in his research. And, um, but it's a hard read because it is a terrible story. So you do want to use, I used it with high schoolers mostly. But that book really, um, even as I was teaching it, opened my eyes to how if we aren't careful and if we aren't in the word of God, we can be taken in and we can be fooled. We can fool ourselves. We can um, conjure up our own uh, callings and understandings. And and that's what happened, I believe, with all of this. You know, they didn't have the Bible to read and they didn't know better. And so they, in their, the best way they knew how were trying to please God and wound up with a tragic situation. But that really impacted me that we've got to be reading the word of God and know what it says so that we don't get fooled or deceived um, into believing things we shouldn't believe. So that was very important. That sounds like a book I need to pick up. That sounds really cool. I, I what is it? I have my... Uh, bookworm kid that might be a little too young for that one, but still like he would probably eat that one up. <laughs> yeah, it's it's really you don't want to put it down. That's for sure. The story is just when I read it, it was one volume. Now he's done it into three volumes because the one volume was huge, <laughs> and so now oh, it's three call different an books. Omnibook now. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but it's it's just excellent. It really is. And there's a younger. Um, when he does on the American revolution and the first part of that one, it's a two parter. The first part of that one is from England's perspective. And the Mm -hmm. second part is from America's perspective of all that was going on then. And it's called the list and it's really good. And it's more about a fifth, sixth grade level. Um, So Mm -hmm. yeah. And then he has books for adults uh, beyond that, but they're almost all historical fiction or, and he writes devotionals as well, but um, I just love his work and he's not really well known, um, but I just appreciate him so much because he, um, when I called, I, I was trying to work on my lesson plans. And so I contacted him and I said, you know, I don't have any materials to use with your books. You know, do you have any suggestions? So he wrote a a letter to my students and posed some questions about the themes that are in the book. And, and they just thought that was the coolest thing ever that the author wrote to them. And it just helped to bring the book alive uh, to life for them and to discuss those themes. And it was just special. So it's kind of neat. He's a cool guy. Very cool. It is neat when kids can see beyond pages of a book and see that there is a person behind that. There is intention and thought. Yeah. Lots of prayer sometimes (laughs) 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 and all that. Well, I love the devotional that you've put together. I've had the privilege of reading through some of it. And um, I love that it's going to be a great resource for parents to take those books that are fun and you know what they see on the library shelves at their public mm-hmm. school or at their church and to be able to take those and 
be intentional with every book that comes into your home, not just the ones that are Bible specific. I think that yeah. there's great wisdom that can be gleaned from uh, all books, but I love that you have done that with these just fun uh, books that kids just absolutely love. Yeah, it was so much fun. <laughs> <laughs> now, what can we expect next from you, Terry? Well, I'm working on the second volume. <laughs> it won't be out probably for another year or so, but um, that one. And then I have a curriculum that is, um, you can use it as a Bible curriculum or just as a Bible study with the family. And I have David, The Life of David is out. It's called um, Heroes of Faith. And I'm working on Esther that will be out soon. And then we'll have Daniel after that. And eventually I love character studies because we learn so much from the characters in the Bible. So that's what this is. And uh, so that's coming out soon, the Esther one. And then um, you can also find me in uh, like upper room devotionals now and then I'll have one starlight magazine for kids. If, if your listeners know about starlight, I love that magazine. It's only been out a short time, but it's fantastic. And I've had two published two stories published in that. So, you know, I'm around here and there. <laughs> Just you know, staying a little busy, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, Terry, where can people find out about you and your books? Well, they can find everything from my website, terryhellardbrown.com. And that's probably the easiest because you can link to anything from there, social media and all my books and everything are there. So that's the easiest. Well, we'll have that in the show notes for sure, just so people can find you easily and to discover your books too. Thank you so much for joining us today, Terry. I've enjoyed this so much. Thank you for having me. My pleasure. And thank you for joining Terry and me on this episode of the Bookworthy podcast. Check the show notes for any books or links that we discussed and let us know in the comments what's your favorite Easter candy. And be sure to like and subscribe so we can discover great books together. Happy reading.